Hello, everyone, and welcome into Senior Living Live. My name is Melissa. I hope you're having a great day today. Uh, we are going to arm you with some tools and information you can use to help a senior loved one this upcoming holiday season. It is just around the corner. We've got an excellent panel today uh, of experts joining us to help answer all of your questions. This webinar will look a little bit different than our previous webinars. We have three very knowledgeable guests available to help you and your family here this afternoon. Laura Ellen Christian is joining us along with Ann Keaton and Susan O'Hare. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing from you here momentarily. Uh, nice to see you all and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, we will spend the first couple of minutes getting to know each of these uh, fantastic ladies and then we will get right to your questions. So in order to do that, you can scroll down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. You can type out your question there. I will read each of your questions to our panel and uh, hopefully they can guide you in the right direction. Just a reminder that all lines and cameras will be off and muted throughout the presentation. So it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our first guest, Laura Ellen Christian. Laura Ellen, take it away. Yeah. Hey everybody, it's great to see you. I am Laura Ellen Christian with the Arbor Company. I support our communities in engagement, um, what our residents are involved in day to day and in their lives at our communities. I also partner with our resident care team um, to head up our training connected to dementia care. And it's great to be here with you today. I know we're all getting ready for the holidays and with that always comes connection with our family. We know this year it might look a little different and feel a little different, but I'm sure everybody is finding ways to still stay connected with your loved ones. So I wanna share with you just some tips of if you are connecting with people, whether it be in person or virtually or other ways, here are some things that you can look for just to make sure that you have peace of mind that your loved one is doing okay. And we'll talk also about if you're noticing maybe something's not going okay, what are some ways that you can really wrap your arms around them? So when you are connecting with your loved ones, I encourage you to kind of think about four buckets. Um, the first is health and then safety, socialization and cognitive functioning. So when you think about the health of someone, think about kind of, from your own perspective, you know, how are we feeling? Are we feeling any pain? Are we starting to feel weaker? I mean, a lot of times when we're having conversations with people, we can hear that in our voices, right? So if you're connecting with someone routinely, you might notice those subtle changes that, that might give us a, a yellow or red flag that someone might be struggling a little bit with their health. Can you hear something different in your voice? If you're seeing them, whether it's through FaceTime or in person, usually we can tell when someone's not feeling good or something maybe is changing when we see them in their just nonverbal communication. Are they looking a little paler? Are they looking a little bit weaker? So really some things to, to tune into around someone's health and how you think they're doing. In the safety bucket, this is really connected to your loved one's environment. Are they safe in the place that they spend the most of their time? Are their spaces tending to be more crowded? Are they having difficulty navigating? That could be navigating because of things are crowded or they're unsafe rugs or things on the floor. It could be navigating that, gosh, my mom and dad live in this big house and they've got to navigate the stairs and I'm maybe noticing some difficulty with that. Um, have they moved down to the guest bedroom on the first floor because they're having a hard time navigating the stairs up to their room? Some things to look for. Also, who's close by? If they do have a safety concern or something happened, do they have neighbors close by? Do they have a system to call out for help? So those are some things that you can start um, tuning into around their safety. The other one is socialization. And I really wanna make sure that um, I highlight for everybody, this looks different for everybody. So if I've never been a social butterfly and I've never been the person that 
that goes out and about and has a huge friend group, right? That's not, it's not going to change for me. So really think about who is my loved one? Who have they always been? And then think about changes that you might be noticing compared to that. What I really like to encourage people to, to assess is, does my mom or dad have meaningful engagement and connection to the outside world? Um, are they feeling connected to a sense of purpose as well as people that are comfortable for them? So maybe your mom was you know, part of a bridge group and, and maybe that bridge group is kind of broken up and they no longer meet, right? Things to, to look out for. Maybe you're noticing or hearing that they're missing going to church when that was something that was really important to them. Maybe your dad stopped, you know, going up to the local coffee shop to meet up with his buddies. Just kind of listen out for what might be happening. And also if they are vocal in voicing their sadness or their loneliness, they're kind of talking about that a lot more. Those can be some, some yellow or red flags. And then the fourth bucket I mentioned is cognitive functioning. So we all know some of those common things to look out for, you know, is my loved one starting to, to not remember as well as she used to? Um, are they starting to repeat themselves? But you can also look for things like, gosh, are they getting a little shorter with their temper, right? Or, or, or is it a lot easier for me to push my mom's buttons um, than it was before? Um, are they making up a lot of excuses? So really toning into, you know, where we think they are. Their driving is also another big thing um, to assess. Are they getting lost um, when they're going to, to places that should be familiar? So those four buckets are really helpful and, and hopefully it's helpful for you to think about that in buckets so you don't get so overwhelmed of what is it that I should be looking for? So again, those are health, safety, socialization, how that connects to your loved one individually and cognitive functioning. And I'll, I'll say too, it's helpful to think in those four buckets, think of a stop, a stoplight, right? A stoplight is red, yellow, and green. And so think about in those four buckets, what color would I associate, right? With the things that I'm noticing or hearing. Um, if you're getting um, a, a yellow and definitely a red light in any one of those four areas, then that's time to really start having um, some conversation with your loved one, or with other people that are kind of maybe in your care coordination group around your loved one, your, your siblings, your other people that you know are connected in um, with your mom or your dad. So, um, so those are just some, some quick tips and I am going to pass the ball over to Ann. I'm Ann Keaton. I am a certified life coach and grief recovery specialist and I help people move through loss. And we're going to start with grief, the definition of grief. So grief is conflicting feelings about the end of or change in a familiar pattern or of behavior. And um, so number one, notice that, well, number one, notice that it's probably a definition that surprises you a little bit because it doesn't say anything about a specific situation or specific feelings. Conflicting feelings about the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. So um, it could be a positive change, it could be a negative change. And also notice that it certainly uses the word feelings, which lets you know that this is an emotional thing. And a lot of times what happens with emotional matters is because we don't really do grief very well culturally, we avoid that and we tend to go to the intellectual. So if you're having a conversation with a loved one or even a less than loved one um, that you might have some responsibility for, uh, whether it's about like moving or just about the changes that you see in their patterns of behavior, um, the temptation is to have an intellectual conversation with them. And yet probably what they're gonna be having is an emotional conversation with you. And it's like, we're just talking on two different levels and we're not really connecting. And so they may be portraying their emotional truth, which is I'm scared, I'm overwhelmed, I'm worried, I'm stuck, I'm mad at these changes. And then we try and give them intellectual answers about like why this is gonna be better and why it should be that way. And we just don't connect, right? Because we're having an intellectual conversation when what they're really having is an emotional wow. conversation. Um, so it makes these conversations 
tricky and hard and like things that we often want to avoid. Um, but I want you to know, first and foremost, that we are talking about grief. We're talking about issues of grief and it's, it's deeper than just the practicalities. So moving, when we talk about moving, um, that is really one of the most overlooked sources of grief. Because think about that definition, conflicting feelings about a change in a familiar pattern of behavior. When we move, everything familiar changes, right? So um, even if we don't like our current home and the home that we're leaving, we know it, we know it well, we know every nook and cranny, we might love our yard, we know our neighbors, our friends, our religious communities, our grocery stores, our dry clean, we understand like where our stuff is in the grocery store, right? So um, all those, all, literally all those patterns and behaviors change when we move, which makes us inevitably have conflicting feelings, which means we're experiencing grief, right? Even if it's a move that we want to make, we're still gonna have some conflicting feelings about that. Um, so an important thing to know about those conflicting feelings are that they're natural, they're normal, and they're unavoidable, okay? Conflicting feelings don't mean that you've made a wrong decision. They don't, they're not an indictment of you. Um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing and know that you're not going to make a big decision, especially as you assess your loved one's um, living situation. You're not going to assess and or make decisions about that without having the conflicting feelings. So expect them. Again, know that they're not an indictment of you. They don't make you wrong. And also don't get stuck here. It's a really easy place to get stuck, either as the person contemplating the move or as the, as the um, family member trying to help facilitate that conversation in that process, right? So the bad news is that there are conflicting feelings, they're unavoidable and you can't escape them. The good news is that there's conflicting feelings, it's unavoidable and you can't escape them. And since that's the case, then give yourself permission to make decisions and have conversations that are gonna be hard because you're not gonna escape it either way, right? Does that make sense? I hope it's kind of weird not to have any interaction with you. Um, lastly, like this isn't easy stuff, right? This isn't easy stuff, but you've done many difficult things in your life and you can do this too. Again, whether you're the person contemplating a move or you're the family member or support, per support person helping through this, deciding to move isn't easy. Staying isn't easy conflicting feelings with either subset. But if you wait too long and something bad happens, then that makes staying even harder, right? So don't wait, don't wait for a crisis to make the decision. Don't wait for a crisis to have the conversation. Start the conversation. You don't have to talk about it the whole time, but don't avoid it, right? And if something's bothering you or you're noticing things in those buckets that Laura Ellen just mentioned, start talking about it, okay? You can do this. It doesn't have to be bad, but it's important to do them. Be loving, be friendly, be kind, and be bold, all right? And have those conversations. Trust yourself. Trust your family member. You can do this. You've done other hard things. Don't not do it. And with that in mind, I'm going to send it off to Sue. All right. My name's Susan O'Hare. My mom is a resident at... Arbor Terrace in Morris Plain. She's been there for three years and it was a hard decision to make, but it needed to be done for a lot of reasons. Exactly what um, Ann just said, that it was a lot of different things. And her main reason was she kept falling and then they would come and get her. She had her button, the police would come, the ambulance would come, they'd take her to the hospital. Then she'd end up in the hospital, then she'd end up in rehab. So that was the main reason why, you know, we couldn't keep doing this. It was crazy. We kept saying, mom, we can't do this. It's not, you know, right. And, and each social worker at every location would say, I can't believe she's 89 years old and she still lives alone. So we were feeling very guilty that maybe we're being, you know, selfish by leaving her there because that's what she really wanted. But 
really it was her safety that was the main thing and like you say then we'd feel terrible if she did really get hurt and every time she fell though she never got hurt because she goes down very slow so each time she fell it was never really an issue you know so so now she's she's at a place where where she can get immediate help um that she needs yeah. so yeah. Um, as, as we uh open up the the uh panel now for questions with ann and laura ellen um, I, I guess uh, I'll throw the first question to you, Sue, um, okay. regarding the holidays and, and your mother in um, her current community. How is that going to look for your family? Well, we're able to do a Zoom and we're able to see her outside on the patio. So we can do that. But this is the first year that she, we really haven't been able to take her out. So I don't know how that's going to work. She's not really happy about it. She's really been giving us a hard time the past few months because it's just been too much lockdown for her. And she is very social. So she doesn't like being stuck in a room and not being able to talk to people. She can, but it's five minutes instead of a half hour or an hour. Right. So the holiday is going to be a little rough for her, I'm sure. They're doing everything they can to have the Thanksgiving dinner and have the whole thing. And we will Zoom, but Zoom at her age is very confusing to her. She swears that we're there and she starts to try to hand us stuff through the screen. And, you know, if we say we're going to the bathroom, she's telling us where it is at Arbor Terrace. Like it's it's funny, but it's really not funny, you know, but it is funny. So for a couple of days after we do a Zoom, she gets very confused. So sometimes we're not sure if we should do it or not, but we're going to try it again for Thanksgiving. Wonderful. Um, well, I uh, appreciate your perspective. Um, you know, we have experts uh, who, who, uh, this is what they do for a living. They, they're, they're to help our seniors and help, um, families help their seniors. And then we have, uh, uh, we, we've added you to this panel, somebody who's going through it currently right now with, with a family member. So we appreciate your insight, uh, just as much. Sue, thank you so much. Thank um, you. So now is a good time for, for those of you who are watching to submit any questions you might have uh, concerns that you may have leading up to the holidays regarding your loved ones who may be um, living at home as Sue's mother was, or who may be in an uh, assisted living community, um, and, and maybe ways that you can uh, help your, your loved one at this time uh, as we do. Um, some of us won't be able to be physically with our, our, our uh, loved one uh, for the holidays, but as she mentioned, Zoom is a good opportunity. How can we do this in a pandemic? Yeah, I think, you know, Sue mentioned Zoom. I know it doesn't um, work for everyone, but it does at least let you see and hear um, your loved one. Um, so as much as you can connect through Zoom or other um, virtual ways, FaceTime and other things like that. But I think this is where we've really got to rely on each other. And this is where it's really important to have that team of people that can help you wrap your arms around your loved ones when maybe physically you can't wrap your arms around your loved one. So, you know, really think about who is close that you can call on. Maybe you've never had to call on them before, but maybe this is the time that you can call on them and they can be there with your loved one and help um, communicate and back and forth with you, get some information and, and help you um, get what you need. Also, um, you know, connecting in with the pastor, the priest, um, other religious figures that your loved one might be connected with, giving them a call, um, close friends, neighbors. So it, it's really the time to lean on each other, right? And not feel um, like you're in imposition or feel guilty for reaching out and creating that circle of friends um, and that circle of um that kind of care coordination is, is kind of what we call it in our community. So the doctors as well, bringing them into your circle. If your loved one is living in a, in a senior living community, knowing that we are an extended part of your family um, and, and we want to help and, and help brainstorm ways, just like Sue was saying, if you're having trouble with Zoom and, and things like that, we wanna help brainstorm ways and kind of bring those creative juices to the table to help people feel Feel that connection. In terms of what Laura Ellen was just saying, and even Sue with Zoom, I wanted to just go back to the sort of this idea of conflicting feelings, you know, and if we're with our family for the holidays and we feel like it's risky because of COVID, we have conflicting feelings. If we're not with them because we think that's safer for COVID, we have conflicting feelings, right? And so that yep. either option, there's something that feels bad about either option. 
you know, and just knowing that unfortunately we're in a situation where we have two hard options. Same thing, like if you if you have to call a neighbor to check in on your parents in a way that you've never had to do that before. You can have conflicting feelings about calling that person. You're going to have conflicting feelings about not calling that person and not enrolling them. And so for there to be a lot of um, compassion for ourselves, for the situation, for our loved ones, and just knowing again, that, that we are kind of stuck with some bad options, you know, and how do we pick the, how do we pick the subset that works the best for us? But to know that it's like, unfortunately, there's not just sort of this great option C out there. Oh, I'll take that. I'll take that one. I don't want this COVID one, you know, where we're together. I don't want this COVID one where we're apart. I'll, I'll pick the other one. And it's not out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so just sort of knowing the context from which we're having to approach these holidays, these conversations, and the people that we might need to enroll that we might not have otherwise had to do that. And then that can be hard. That's a great point. Uh, excellent. Um, so we we do have a question from Anonymous, and I'm going to just leave it open to the panel. Whoever may want to answer can certainly answer. Um, in addition to falling, are there other things that would make assisted living a necessary option? Yes, not being able to feed themselves or buy their groceries, quite a bit of options, and not getting as much socialization as they really need. Some people are locked up in their house and nobody comes to see them. So, you know, it is hard. There's a lot of reasons when it comes down to it. And sometimes it's your own feeling of security that you know somebody's watching your parent or your family member when you're, you can't be there 24 seven. So when they're in a, a facility, you know somebody's there all the time and they have that button to press, somebody could come. So it is a security for both the family and I, I think also the resident. And I would, I would love to, to add in to Sue. Thank you for sharing that, Sue. I think that's right. And um, one thing that I would add, which Sue mentioned a little bit is with, you know, with her mom, um, the falls never, never got to a fall that was, um, that was an injury or something, you know, catastrophic. But I think a reason to look for options is to be proactive um, so that the fall doesn't happen as much as possible, right? Um, and right. not saying that that assisted living can prevent all falls either, but someone is there and we can be those eyes and we're kind of trained to look through those lens of health and safety and socialization and cognitive functioning. So oftentimes with, with a lot more people around, we can catch things a little bit sooner. So I, I just want to put that out there as well as it's a really great proactive move. And Sue mentioned socialization. That is a huge one that sometimes we often miss um, of how lonely our loved ones might be, um, especially if they're living alone or maybe um, they're, they're living with their spouse, but their neighbors have moved or some of their friends have passed away. So really digging into the socialization. And like I was saying earlier, it's not that they're going to move in and all of a sudden become social butterflies if that wasn't who they were. But sometimes just knowing that a friend is next door that you can go talk to and you can go knock on their door or you can come down to the bistro and have a cup of coffee and you're going to be able to see some life and people buzzing around. That gives you a really good feeling that having that cup of coffee on your porch where nobody's around at your home doesn't give you that same sense of warmth. Let's backtrack here. So we talk about um, uh, reasons why someone might need uh, assistance. Um, how about the, that initial conversation it, when, when you may uh, see your loved one over the holidays, it might be, you may be having a dinner outside, um, maybe through Zoom. Um, and if you feel like it is that that's the next step, and this is open to the panel, how do you initiate that conversation with the loved one th that you have or that you have concerns about uh, for the need to move to senior living? I'll jump in for starters on this one. And it's a great, and it's a great question because though I've just encouraged people to have the conversation, like starting the conversation, a lot of times people say the start is where I get stopped, you know, don't stop at the start. And um, to let everybody know that the words I imagine are the most emotionally expansive words in the English vocabulary, right? So you, we can start with, oh, wow, you know, I imagine this might be hard to hear me say, 
or I imagine this might be a difficult topic, but I wanted to ask you, or I was noticing, you know, and, and start, well, and you can even take a page out of my daughter's playbook. She's done a great job with me throughout life. And she'll say, mama, I need to tell you something, but I'm afraid it's going to upset you. And it's sort of, you know, it invites me to kind of relax. Now that might be harder to do with your, with your own parent, depending on, you know, um, how things are, but knowing number one, that everybody has at least, is at least 10% right. And so I'm not trying to enforce my position on them. I want to start a conversation. I imagine instead of, I know, we don't know how anybody feels at any given moment for any reason. We can, we can imagine it, but we don't actually know because we're not them. So starting with, I imagine is a very easy kind of gentle lead in. Mm -hmm. And whether it goes well or it doesn't, I'm still going to go back to stay with it, have the conversation. Hopefully it goes well, but don't avoid it just because they're resisting. Don't avoid it just because you're resisting. <laughs> I love that, Ann. I love the phrase, I imagine. I think that's such great, great advice. I would add on to the great advice Ann gave of, um, we kind of have a saying in our cognitive care training with our staff of be their friend, not their boss, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're still their child. <laughs> if this is your mom or your dad and mm -hmm. you know, the roles didn't just all, all of a sudden reverse. Um, so, so be their friend, still be their daughter, be their son and, and not their boss. And sometimes you might not be the right person to have the conversation with them because of your relationship with them. So go back to that team, go back to that team that you've created. Is there somewhere else, someone else on that team that's better positioned to have this conversation? And then don't try to have all the conversations in the one conversation, right? Prioritize, you know, think about what's most important. I'm just going to start here and see how that goes. I don't want to data dump every single thing I've noticed. I want to really be thoughtful. Is it low hanging fruit that I think it might be a quick win with my mom or dad, or is something like red light flashing and I've just got to jump in like Ann says, and I've just got to bite the bullet and have the conversation. Who else should be there with me? Um, so think about some of those as well. So we've talked about having the conversation, guys, right? Or it might be time to make the move to senior living. Uh, Sue gave us a great example uh, as to what it was that made the determining factor for her family, for her mother, to make the move to senior living. I will open it up to the panel again for these, maybe the combo question here. And that is, um, how do you go about choosing a senior living community? And how can you maybe address some of the concerns of moving into a community during a pandemic? We, um, we were in one assisted living before we landed in Arbor and it was a very bad experience. And so it ended up that my children, because my um, father-in-law was in an assisted living too, and he was in a very nice one, but they could, didn't have an opening for my mom and anyway. So she ended up in this other one and we weren't happy. Nobody was happy, but when my children went to see it, they almost blew a gasket because it just was not the right place. And it wasn't fair that she would be in not as nice as their grandfather. So we went to Arbor Terrace and they were just so warm and welcoming and the place was so clean and it was new and just everybody did everything. It just made you feel so good that they didn't have their Pacific jobs. Everybody did everything, whatever that needed to be done at that point. If somebody needed to answer the phone, they did. It was just such a welcoming feeling. Everybody was so nice. So when, of course, we left the other place and came to Arbor. And since then, my mother was very happy until this pandemic. And now it, she's locked up and things are different and it's not the same and they don't get to socialize as much, but that's everywhere, you know, so it's not, but um it was a very hard decision. And I just want to say they are not going to want to go. You have to talk, have many conversations before they want to go anywhere. And you can understand it. Like my mother always says, it's the end of my life. And now I know that this is where I'm going to be for the end of my life. And, and she is, and it's true. And it, it, it's sad. And they, they have to realize like exactly what you said, they're giving up everything. And when you mentioned about the house and how they knew where everything was, it's true. Cause my mother still to this day will say, go to my house, go in that cabinet. I have a tweezer in there. Can you bring it? You know, and nothing's there, but in her mind, she still envisions that. And so it is hard and it's not easy, 
but you have to know that that's the safest place for you, you know, family member, wherever it might be. And as long as you have loving people that feel that they're your family, and you know how many times they tell us, you're like our family, and we feel like we're there. So that's a wonderful, I think that's the main thing. You have to go there and see how you feel. It's almost like going to, you have to go to your field in. I'm probably, it says you're in, but you have to feel like you fit in with those people. Do you know, like they're the same type of people as the backgrounds. And that's what it was like. We went a few times, the vision was the wrong one, but this one was the right one. So it has to be how you feel, you know, location. We went a little further than we thought we would go, but we felt that my mom was getting better care here. So we don't mind traveling the half hour, you know? So that's the way we, that's how we chose, you know, where we would go. I actually have a follow-up to that, Sue. Um, again, uh, your, your uh, experience is, I, I think, um, one that many share. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the different communities that your mother has lived in. Right. Certainly at the, the Arbor community. How has your mother's life Im improved? How has her, how have her circumstances improved? How has she improved by moving into a, a senior living community? And, and, you know, taking COVID into account, of course. I know that's why it's hard to answer now because of that, but she was very social. She met so many friends there. She is a social person anyway. So that wasn't the issue. A lot of people that come there, residents aren't social. And my sister and I also volunteer a lot there when we could. And so that brought a lot, you know, together. And we felt like a community there, but she has changed because she has somebody there to help her all the time. And she feels, I think, secure because somebody's there at night. Somebody's there in the day. If she falls, they watch her, they know her. I always say they added 10 years onto your life, mom. And she, you know, because the doctors are there, they check her constantly. She could go whenever she wants to the nurse's station. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's really a wonderful thing. I always say, find me a place like this later on, you know, like it's just, they care about you and you just, so it has helped her in a lot of ways, but she still swears she could be home, although she can't because she can't move. But that's what I, they have, you have to be aware that that's how they're going to feel. And they all feel the same. I talk to all the residents when I'm there and they all wish they were home, but they know that this is the best place and they do enjoy it and they have fun and there's things that they do. And it really helps the person that wasn't so, so social. Like my mother was social. So thank God it kept up that way. But I feel these places help the people that aren't real social because they make you get out. They come and get you out of your room. They make you feel good about yourself. And that they never make you feel like you're like, you know, a problem or whatever. They always make you feel good about yourself. And that's really what you want. You know, you want, you don't want them to feel like, you know, they're a burden or they're a problem. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you did. And, and I, I'm taking with me away what you said that it, you felt like it's given 10 years of, of life to your mom. And I, um, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's, that's the biggest take I've received from that. So thank you so much for that perspective. That, that, is, that is fantastic. Um, yeah. This is welcome to the panel. This is a question that we received. Uh, assisted living versus independent living. And that will be either for Laura, Ellen, Christian, or for Anne. Uh, either one of you can uh, decide who wants to take that question. You know, I think um, the difference in independent living and assisted living is, you know, one is built and designed with care in mind. Um, it, it has the, all of the social aspects and kind of the, the lifestyle built into it as well, but the care in mind has definitely been, been designed there and it's at the ready, right? It's at your fingertips. Um, for independent living, that is really for people that are, you know, ready just to kind of take that next step down, um, to downsize their homes, to really think about what their lifestyle is, how they can not um, do the chores, do the cooking, have options to, to eat in the dining room or make a meal in their own apartment. Um, we also have care options um, within independent living, um, but the, the um, socialization, the connection with people and kind of having those amenities, if you will, at your fingertips um, is, is really great and, and a highlight of independent living. And like I said, so those transition with you with assisted living, you've got some of those same great amenities um, that come with independent living, but the, the care piece is just right there at your fingertips. Um, so 
assisted living is a, is a great option for those that already identify that they need something. It's a great option if you are a husband and wife and someone needs a little bit more care um, than the other. Assisted living is great. Um, and then, you know, independent living is a great option too if, if you're not quite ready for care. And a lot of communities come with independent living, assisted living, as well as, as maybe a memory care um, neighborhood. So, so when you need to make those transitions, it's a little bit easier. Anne, do you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the thing that I would add is that knowing that moving is this huge source of grief, setting your family member up to have less moves, less transition, you know, that continuum of care, just in terms of experiencing grief, um, seems like something to really pay attention to. So it's not like, okay, well, I've got my parent here. We went through all the heartache to get them here. And now somehow we got to move them again to somewhere else. We got to move them into memory care when they've been elsewhere. Like um, I had a client, he actually just did all this grief recovery work with me on his move. And he's 74. He's moving bef well before any crisis has hit. And he's going to a place where he knows he'll be taken care of no matter what. And he won't have to go through that grief and that heartache of making another transition. He's good to go. It was hard to make it initially. He's done the work to do it. And now he's set and he can relax into that. And I do think there's really something to be said for not setting ourselves and our family members up for more difficult transitions down the road. And on the heels of that, uh, a question, and for you, how, how can we make that transition easy for our loved one and for ourselves? Very good question, because it's not an easy transition, right? I mean, it's, it is grief. And when we think of grief, we think of heartache and we think of loss and we think of pain. And this is very much a source of grief. So number one, we need to know it's grief. We need to not expect it to be otherwise. We need to know that all the intellectual answers about why this is going to work and why this makes so much sense is not going to, it's not satisfying, right? Um, and there are things that we can do to minimize it, right? Number one, know that we're going to feel conflicted no matter what we choose. So the fact that we're feeling conflicted about the move doesn't mean we shouldn't be making it. Doesn't mean it's the wrong decision, right? So number one, we need to know the context. Um, the other thing that we can do, well, what, I'm back up a little bit. Another problem is it's really easy for loved ones to get stuck on kind of this perfect vision of the past and the present and uh, like an extreme bad version of what's coming. This is all great and that's all bad. Right. And so touching base with what are the pros of where I am right now? What are the cons of where I am right now? What are the pros of where am I going? What are the cons of where I'm going? And that those are more even than they might perceive. And then when it's time to go or anticipating that it's time to go, what we want to do is we want to get emotionally complete with where we've been. Right. We want to be able to say thank you and goodbye and not have any unfinished business with our home, with our community. And there are exercises actually for doing that. One of which I did this with my mom and my sisters when my mom sold her house of 43 years is literally going to each room in the house, telling the stories of what happened in that room, positive and negative, and then saying thank you and goodbye to the living room to the kitchen, you know, to the, to the gazebo, to the yard, to the house overall, to our community. And I think it restores our sense of peace that we've done there what we needed to do and that we have some power. It reminds us that we are actively choosing, that it's not just being taken away from us. And thank you and goodbye. And it sounds silly, but I just found a thermometer that I got when my son was born, a little digital one. It doesn't work anymore right? It needs to go in the trash. I don't need to hold on to a $10 thermometer that I bought 24 years ago. And so I literally was like, okay, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, thermometer. You've served us well and goodbye. And it sounds hokey, but it actually makes a difference. I don't think it sounds hokey. 
<laughs> I'm going to add that to my list of uh, list of coping mechanisms too. It's it's a fantastic tip. Uh, thank you so much for that. And um, we we've got a question now uh, to Kevin from Kevin, uh, and this may be for Sue or for Laura Ellen. Um, Sue, I'll let you answer this first, since your mother is currently uh, in an assisted living community. He wants to know what about parents who are in assisted living but still want to go places and do things off the grounds? Again, putting COVID aside because of restrictions within the state, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, what are the options there? That can still happen. They could leave the community at any time for to go on a family vacation or vacation by themselves. And they also have trips and things that the community does also. So they have two options now, because not only can they go with the family, now they could go with the community. So, um, and they really do quite nice things and you sign up and they do very nice things. So I have to say, if you pick a, you know, a facility that does that, it's wonderful. They have, now they have doubled the way they could travel and do things. So. Laura Ellen. Yeah, I think Sue, that was a great answer. I think that's exactly right. That just um, just because you move into an assisted living community doesn't mean that that you aren't still who you are and you can't still right. do what you want to do. So you know we're we're not we're not um, we're not restricting that um, for our our residents. So we what we want to do is support them and how to continue to do the things that they've always done. Right. Um, support them and helping to do things that they've always wanted to do but never had the time, right? Support them and doing like the out of the wall. What if? What about this? Um, you know, we have a um, at the Arbor Company. We have a dreams program that is just so fun to connect in with our residents. We've we've taken residents skydiving. We've taken residents to um, to fly in old restored biplanes. Um, you know, we've, we've taken residents to ride a horse for the first time. So, you know, assisted living does not mean that, that that door closes. Really, I think like Sue was saying, that door opens even wider um, because right. you've got your family to support you. You've got the people in the community to support you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now we are going to get into the holiday spirit here. We're going to have some questions about the holidays specifically, but before we do, as we sort of wrap up this webinar and, and again, maybe the, the biggest signals in that checklist of what you can look, uh, look at for your loved one and, and wondering if it, is it the right time to make that move to senior living? Um, on that end, maybe one answer from each of you, your biggest, most important signal that loved ones should be looking out for during this holiday season that would suggest it is time for additional care. And Anne, we'll start with you. What I would say is um, we know something's going to happen, right? Like some, we're get, people are getting older, something's going to happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so not waiting for a crisis, everything that I've said about transition being hard, it's hard under real, under circumstances in which you had the power to choose. You got to look at different locations and you got to pick the one that was right for you. It is only made worse in a crisis where a decision has to be made. It has to be made in a hurry. You're yeah. stuck with limited options because there's not, you know, um, availability where you want to go. Like, anticipate what's coming and plan in advance you know so it doesn't have to be oh oh no all these red all the red lights are up like no we know it's coming don't wait for the red light mm -hmm. don't wait our, our wise friend brand says you're either going to go too early or you're going to go too late you know you can't find the perfect time go early Go before you need it, when you get to choose what you want for your future and your life. Not when there's a crisis and your kids have to decide and they're in the middle of a crisis. One piece of advice um, for me, maybe it's just because of, of the role I serve and engagement, but I really think the socialization, um, how your loved one is feeling like they still have purpose in their life and kind of meaning and things to give back. Um, that to me is the sometimes the biggest thing, right? Our health concerns, our safety concerns, we're able to see those a lot more. They're kind of more out in the open, but really digging deep 
and making sure your loved one really feels that sense of purpose and, and how you can um, help them do that. How do you notice when that's missing? Um, usually it's in the sadness and the loneliness and, and really taking note of those things, which sometimes is easy to, to overlook. So, so really think about that. How can you help your loved ones still feel like um, that they have meaning and they have things left mm -hmm. to give because they do. Um, and then, you know, of course, the big red flags are, um, you know, if, you're, if your loved one is just watching TV all day, if, if they're eating freezer meals all the time, you know, if they're looking in the refrigerator and they don't have those healthy choices, no matter what that might be as a healthy choice for your life, but if you're noticing those healthy choices, either they're not making them, they're not making good choices, or the ability for them to have that as a choice is becoming more and more limited. Sue, what would you add? I would just say you're right. You have to make them feel important. And we try to do things on the holidays that we would go there and you know make an issue or take them out. And we buy presents that my mom could give to everybody. So she feels like she's still involved. And well, you want to give this or you want to do that or you want to do this. We try to let her have you know, make some decisions on our own. Cause you're right. Cause once they go in assisted living, they do feel like everything's been taken away from them all of a sudden, even though it hasn't, they have that feeling because they're told when, they, you know, they have a time when they can eat, they have a time when they do this, they have a time and they're not used to that. So that's why we always try to let her have some decisions. Like, do you want to come in? Do you want to go out? Do you want to sit? You know, so I agree with you. And I also agree with the end. Don't wait till it's the time where you have to just pick any place. You want to pick the right place at the right time. And there are places that will let you stay for like a couple of weeks. And you could even mention that, you know, like sometimes when people go away, like the, their children go away, they will put their loved one in an assisted living for like a month if they're going to be gone and they could see how they like it, you know? So that's a lot of option too, that I didn't realize that you could have until we started to look into that. And that was a, a almost a way to try to get my mother in to say, mom, let's see how you like this place. Let's see what it is. You know, how, you might like it. You might not. Maybe you're not ready yet. Like you said, maybe we'll find out you're not ready. Maybe we have to wait another year. Like you don't know, but they do like to have options and they do still like to feel that their, their decisions still count and they still have some say in stuff because it does kind of get taken away some of it. And it's understandable, you know, but what are some festive ideas or tips that you can give to those watching to make it a special occasion for your loved one? No matter what the circumstances are, we do still have choices, you right. know, and it can feel like, like Susan was just saying about, you know, the, the, her mother feeling like the choices have been taken away from her. So what are the choices that we still have? It may not be what it was before. We don't have the same choices in COVID that we used to have. You know, and yet what are the choices? What are the baby steps? What are the things that get us a little bit closer to those traditions than, than, than not, you know? Right. That we don't have to just throw it all out because there's, um, because there's COVID. Like I'm having, th I'm hosting Thanksgiving for the first time ever, you know? And, and we're gonna do it outside and we're gonna do it on the deck and we might be cold and, you know, sort of figuring out like, how do you make it silly and fun? Like would we roast marshmallows, which we've never done outside before on Thanksgiving because we've never had Thanksgiving outside before, you know, but like starting to think like, okay, so what are the, what are the choices that I still have here? We always still have choices. Like the, if there's a certain thing, like my mother likes a certain mushrooms or something like that, we could bring that and they can incorporate it with their meal. So things like that, that's what we want to do. And, and just like, you know, we all get together and talk. So we really can't do that. But on Zoom, we're going to try. We just hope she doesn't get a little wacky for about a week because she doesn't understand it. It's really so funny, but it's funny, but it's not, you know, but you can understand like we have trouble. We're not even as old as her. So the Zoom kind of gets her, but it's nice. That, and like you say, it's something different that you would never do on Thanksgiving before, you know, like you're always all together. So this is something that you're right. We have to make choices and try to make it fun, you know? So that's what we're going to do. Bring some of the traditional stuff that she likes and then try to do Zoom and maybe a visit if we could get in the patio visit if it's not up here. <laughs> and Laura Ellen, I mean, I know you guys have some stuff and, and no, no pun intended that you're cooking up <laughs> uh -huh. communities, um, to, to make it special for the residents. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, all of our communities have been so creative during this time. And, mm -hmm. 
And I think we've really taken the opportunity to kind of push the pause button a little bit and really kind of help us get back to the reason for the season. You know, we did some really great brainstorming with teams around, you know, don't think about what you did in the past in our communities, but think about the feelings and the emotions that it brought, right? And so how can you bring the joy? How can you bring the festivity in safe ways? So ways we're doing that are like fun Christmas um, car parades, um, one community I was just in um, this week, they are connecting with each resident who's interested getting their favorite Christmas cookie recipe, and then they're baking it with them one on one. And then they're going to take those cookies they baked and they're going to do a hallway Christmas cookie exchange in the hallway activity right a lot safer than bringing people together um, to do that. One community for Thanksgiving has purchased on the internet and get anything on the internet now Amazon purchase wishbones, a wishbone for every single resident, right? So that they can continue that tradition of Thanksgiving, of pulling the wishbone with prizes of who gets the longest piece or the lucky piece, whatever that is, I can't remember. But um, they're really doing those in addition to our traditional meals that we're always cooking and providing for, for our loved ones. And I love Sue saying, bring us items in, right? If your loved one really is gonna miss out on something, let us know because we can help them that's what we do, deep connections. We can help them still make it special. As we get close to Thanksgiving and then of course Christmas thereafter, um, what are some special holiday traditions that you are really, really, really going to try to continue to incorporate and have maybe found that, that, that special way to work it in uh, via COVID, through COVID as we uh, work through this pandemic? Certainly for Thanksgiving, it's some of the, as, as Susan said, like the foods, you know, I mean, pretty much for the last 30 years, we've had the exact same meal at Thanksgiving. And so I think we're going to have it. It's going to be at my house this year. It's going to be outside. It's going to be different. And there's only going to be five of us, you know, instead of 20. And yet having those same foods, those touchstones, I think regardless of a smaller crowd and regardless of an outdoor setting, like, you know, that's what just sort of helps keep that alive, that that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do. And, um, you know, it may be that we end up doing a Zoom thing too. And one of the things that's cool about Zoom is that there might actually be more people who can participate than would had we been able to do it in person. You know, the, the more extended family gets, now we all get to join together on Thanksgiving in a way that we never would have before. We would have been, there's the Illinois family and here's the Georgia family, you know? And now there's an opportunity for us all to get together on COVID. So it's some of, it's some of both. It's like the old stuff and then some new stuff and kind of making it its own fresh Thanksgiving. I would, I would add to that, you know, as I said, kind of pressing the pause button, I, I think that's what we're kind of doing as a family and really getting back, getting back to the basics, maybe kind of maybe stripping down all of the hoopla that might have been added over the years and getting back to the basics. And for my family, we always um, drew names for Christmas gifts. So we're still able to do that, right? Draw names for Christmas gifts, get that one special present. Um, send things in the mail, right? Sometimes we've gotten away from that of sending emails or sending the Amazon gift card or things like that. So really being intentional about who did I draw this gift for and what is something I can go get and send it to them in the mail um, so they have something to open. And maybe you're Zooming together. Um, you know, we always have a, a special cocktail when we gather for our family. So sending out that recipe to folks and, and maybe doing a Zoom where you're all you know, making that drink, who made it the best, you know, who, who really botched it up, um, things like that. So I think for Zoom calls, adding a purpose to it, kind of um, something that people can bring to it or, or do when you're on the Zoom. I don't know if that might help Sue and, and kind of small chunks, right of, right, of what can we be doing, you know, that's kind of fun, but small chunks get leaves you with that good feeling that you're going for. Um, so those are a few things we're doing. And Sue, you've, you've talked uh, a lot about what you will do for Thanksgiving with your mother, but have you thought ahead already to Christmas or are we not there yet? <laughs> We're not there yet. We have to get through one holiday at a time. <laughs> I, totally understand that. I totally understand that. Um, well, ladies, uh, fantastic job today. Thank you so much for all of the tips and for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, take a bow, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great being with you all. Happy holidays. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Happy, now, happy holidays.
for those of you watching for a complete uh, home for the holidays checklist, we do have one. You can log on to uh, arborcompany.com backslash holiday. And that is where you'll find it. Uh, some great advice there. It's printable for you to take with you if you are, are like Anne and will have a, a close knit family with an outdoor Thanksgiving. It's also shareable via email. And most importantly, guys, it is free. So certainly check that out. And thank you all for spending the day with us. We appreciate you watching. And as always, have a great day, everybody.